welcome to ATCM, the emergency medicine channel. Today, let us discuss about pulmonary embolism and its management in emergency room. It is an obstruction of the pulmonary artery or its branches. It can be due to thrombus or thromboembolism, tumor embolism, air embolism, fat embolism, especially after lower limb traumas. Thrombi can originate from the lower limb like deep vein thrombosis, rarely from upper limb also it can produce or paradoxical embolism can occur through the patent foramen ovale or atrial septal defect. They are called as paradoxical embolism. Normally, it uh, develop, patient develops pulmonary embolism from deep vein thrombosis or as such in the pulmonary vessels itself patient can develop embolism. There are three types of presentation. One is acute presentation. Patient will have acute symptoms. They uh, resemble like acute uh, pneumonia. They have uh, uh, cough, breathlessness, hemoptysis. Sometimes patient can have fever also. Subacute patient can have slightly subacute onset. Within days, patient can develop symptoms. Chronic means it is mainly seen in chronic uh, diseases like. Uh, uh, malignancy or uh, any other inflammatory, chronic inflammatory conditions, rheumatic, rheumatological conditions can also present with chronic pulmonary embolism. Now you can see the risk factors. The major risk factors that is acquired risk factors are prolonged travel and immobility. Patient can develop DVT. From there patient can develop pulmonary embolism. Other risk factors are obesity smoking, surgeries, that means post-surgical period, post-trauma period patient is bedridden from the, uh, from that, during that bedridden period patient can develop DVT or pulmonary embolism. Hormone replacement therapies in female patients, oral contraceptives, antiphospholipid anti syndrome, antibody syndrome, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can be acquired or congenital. But uh, uh, if a patient does not have antiphospholipid syndrome previously, uh, it can be acquired. Some patients can have a genetical problem which can lead to antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Malignancies, old age, these are the causes for acquired risk factors for DVT or pulmonary embolism. Inherited causes are factor V laden mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C, protein S deficiency. These are the causes for inherited thrombophilia. They are called as thrombophilic conditions, inherited thrombophilic conditions. Now we can see the clinical features of uh, pulmonary embolism. Many patients who is having pulmonary embolism can have deep vein thrombosis like the patient can have leg pain, swelling of the calf muscles, tenderness. Sudden onset of chest pain is a classical feature of most of the pulmonary embolism which leads to the infarction of the area. Cough, hemoptysis, breathlessness, pleuritic chest pain and if there is a massive pulmonary embolism patient can have uh, reduced cardiac output and syncope can occur. Signs, tachypnea, tachycardia, these are the most common presentation of pulmonary embolism. Patient have mild cough chest pain, tachypnea, tachycardia. Hypoxia can occur in massive pulmonary embolism. Cyanosis can occur in massive pulmonary embolism. Hypotension due to RV failure also can pr produce by massive pulmonary embolism. Elevated JVP can be there in massive pulmonary embolism. Loud P2 due to acute uh, pulmonary hypertension that can lead to core pulmonary, acute core pulmonary and low grade fever. So these are the signs and symptoms of uh, pulmonary embolism. Many a times pulmonary embolism only have mild symptoms like mild tachypnea, tachycardia and pleuritic chest pain. If it is a massive pulmonary embolism only you see all these clinical findings otherwise we do not see much of the clinical findings. Mortality rate is very high if there is a massive pulmonary embolism up to 30 percent patient can have uh, uh, high mortality. Now there is a criteria called as Wells criteria or modified Wells criteria. This will give you a probable score for uh, pulmonary embolism. Like a patient have symptoms of TVT, 3 points. Other diagnosis less likely than pulmonary embolism, 3. 
heart rate more than 100 1.5 hemobilization more than 3 days surgery in the previous 4 weeks 1.5 points previous dvt pulmonary embolism 1.5 points hemoptysis 1 point malignancy 1 point so probability score if you see high probability if the score is more than 6 moderate 2 to 6 low less than 2 modified well criteria pulmonary embolism likely more than 4 or pulmonary embolism unlikely less than 4 but all these uh, criteria are only uh, uh, like it can predict it can pro give a probable diagnosis sometimes patient can have a typical presentation also they can present like pneumonia uh, uh, mild pneumonia can be on a clinical examination you may make a false diagnosis of mild pneumonia but uh, it can be pulmonary embolism if you see the criteria it may not fit into the criteria so clinical features along with the history is very very important pulmonary embolism normally uh, present as an acute event it is non, not a progressive event it can occur as a chronic event or subacute event but it does not progress so fever and all will be there classically in pneumonia high degree fever chills rigors the and then patient develops uh, uh, lung infiltration but here patient suddenly present with um, uh, symptoms and patient on uh, on x-ray you can see the uh, findings of pulmonary embolism so it will be difficult sometimes in emergency room uh, to make a diagnosis of uh, pulmonary embolism. So, high index of suspicion is required to make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. There is a uh, criteria which can rule out pulmonary embolism that is pulmonary embolism rule out criteria per criteria. Uh, the, the, it, it can detect patient with low risk for pulmonary embolism. Eight factors are there age less than 50, pulse rate less than 100, oxygen saturation more than 94 no unilateral leg swelling, no hemoptysis, no surgery, trauma within 4 weeks, no previous DVT pulmonary embolism, no oral hormone use or contraceptive use. Patients fulfilling 8 criteria are considered as negative for pulmonary embolism. So here we are ruling out all other findings of uh, pulmonary embolism, then we can make a probable diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Again, uh, it will be difficult if the patient is having pneumonia. You have almost all the findings, but you will not have uh, DVT or pulmonary embolism uh, in that type of patients. So, previous DVT, previous pulmonary embolism, unilateral leg swelling, all are very, very important to make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. But uh, rarely, sometimes you can see patient who is having pulmonary embolism may not have any findings of DVT at all. So, clinical high index of clinical suspicion is, is, is very, very important to make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism in emergency room. But in ward, it is okay, we have time, we can make out uh, whether the patient is deteriorating or not. But in emergency room, it will be very, very difficult because in a short span of time, we have to make a diagnosis, we have to take uh, CT scan to rule out pulmonary embolism. So, it will be difficult to make a diagnosis in emergency room itself. Now, if you talk about investigation, one of the most commonly done investigation in pulmonary embolism is plasma D-dimer ELISA. So, if D-dimer is elevated, then pulmonary embolism, you know that uh, D-dimer is a uh, fibrin breakdown product. Uh, wherever there is an inflammation, it can be elevated like it can elevate elevate in myocardial infarction, pneumonia, sepsis, uh, so many conditions it can be elevated and it also elevated in pulmonary embolism. But if you have a patient who is having uh, suspected pulmonary embolism on x-ray, you are seeing pneumonia, elevation of D-dimer does not tell you anything. It, it can be elevated in a severe pneumonia also. So, uh, but if D-dimer is negative in a suspected case of pulmonary embolism, then you can probably rule out pulmonary embolism. So, it's, it has got a very good uh, a negative uh, predictive value. That means, D-dimer is negative, you can rule out pulmonary embolism. D-dimer is positive, then you have lot of differential diagnosis, but it adds to the diagnostic uh, uh, criteria. So, like, uh, it will be elevated in pulmonary embolism. So, you can add to your um, uh, uh, diagnostic investigations. Another 
investigation which will be done in emergency room is ABG. Initially in ABG only tachypnea will be there, so you have PaO2 reduction, but after sometimes or if there is a massive pulmonary embolism, PCO2 can be uh, elevated. Initially both will be reduced, but after sometimes carbon dioxide reduction can occur if the patient will become sick. So initially it is mainly type 1 uh, respiratory failure. ECG normally shows sinus tachycardia only, but uh, there is a classical finding that is S1, Q3, T3. So that can be seen in uh, some patients, but not uh, not in all patients. Other can, other uh, ECG findings are patient can have RBVB, RBH, and atrial fibrillation. So the common finding is always sinus tachycardia. The classical finding is S1, Q3, T3. So here in this ECG, what you are seeing is S1 that means deep S waves in uh, lead 1, Q wave in lead 3, T inversion in lead 3 that is S1, Q3, T3. If this is there with classical symptoms then you can probably make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, but if it is not there that does not mean that patient does not have pulmonary embolism, patient can have pulmonary embolism even without these changes. Now X-ray also same like what we discussed most of the time x-rays are normal in pulmonary embolism but there are some classical findings like Westermark sign and Hampton's hump. Westermark sign is oligemia of the lung field that, that is because from that point onwards the blood vessels are completely cut from the main circulation so you get oligemia that area there is no blood vessels can be traced in that area. Wet shaped pulmonary opacities above the diaphragm that is Hampton sump. Other findings are pleural effusion, enlarged pulmonary artery, elevated diaphragm. These are the findings. But remember, ECG and X ray, most of the patients who is having pulmonary embolism can be normal. Echo is one important tool which can pick up findings in massive pulmonary embolism. But in mild, minimal pulmonary embolism or mild pulmonary embolism, there may not be any change in the echo. So the main findings are increased RV size, that is a main finding in pulmonary embolism. Abnormal septal wall motion like RV free wall hypokinesis and interventricular septal flattering, flattening. McConnell sign, regional wall motion abnormalities that spare the right ventricular apex, right heart thrombus. These are the findings, but remember RV enlargement, that means a lung disease which is producing right ventricular enlargement, we call it as core pulmonary. Acute core pulmonary is a classical finding which can be picked up by echo in massive pulmonary embolism. Other imaging techniques, one is ventilation perfusion scanning or VQ scan. VQ scan, we study ventilation in, in a uh, scan and perfusion in another scan and we find to uh, we will try to find out whether there is any mismatch in ventilation and perfusion. Here ventilation will be normal, but perfusion will be reduced. That is a classical finding seen in pulmonary embolism, but it is a time consuming uh, investigation and it is not available in all hospitals. So uh, this is not a, a very good uh, investigation in emergency rooms. CT chest uh, with contrast uh, is another investigation uh, can be done. Color Doppler or uh, lower leg veins or uh, upper limb veins to rule out DVT should be done in all patients who is having suspected pulmonary embolism. The most important gold standard test is CT pulmonary angiograph, angiography. So that will pick up uh, very even very small emboli it can pick up. So that is very very important. We have to take the patient for CT pulmonary angiography to make a complete diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism. You can see here CT angiogram shows uh, there is a filling defects in the pulmonary arteries. Arrow mark shows filling defects. So that will be the classical finding in pulmonary embolism. So CT angiogram is the most important investigation to make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Ventilation perfusion scan can be done if the patient is very young particularly female patient or suspected pregnant ladies, there we cannot go for CTPA. Patient with history of contrast medium anaphylaxis, 
and strong allergy history, we can try this investigation. Patient with severe renal failure also, contrast cannot be given. Here also we can try this investigation. But remember, this investigation is not a uh, very good investigation like uh, CTPA and it also not available in many centers. It is also time consuming investigation. Now, once we make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, we should find out what is the reason for pulmonary embolism. If there is a strong reason like a prolonged bed rest, trauma, surgery, then that may be the cause for pulmonary embolism. Otherwise, we have to rule out some of the uh, some of the causes for DVT and pulmonary embolism. We have to ask for a antiphospholipid antibodies to rule out antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which can produce thrombus anywhere in the body. Fasting plasma homocysteine level, hyperhomocysteinemia can produce both arterial and venous thrombosis. Flow cytometry in PNH. Protein C and protein S levels, antithrombin 3. These are the two important investigations which can be done in emergency. But remember, in acute thrombus formation, when the thrombus is lysed by the body, protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3, all will be utilized for that. So, in acutely, when you are seeing a low levels of protein C, protein S and antithrombin 3, we cannot brand the patient is in, in, in the bracket of uh, uh, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, antithrombin deficiency. So, in acute thrombosis, all these levels will be low. So, we should not make a diagnosis of uh, deficiency of these proteins or antithrombin 3. So, ideally, after completion of the treatment, once the patient is stabilized of uh, warfarin, then we can try for this investigation. Otherwise, in initially, if you are doing protein C, protein S and antithrombin 3 deficiency, if the levels are normal, then we can rule out protein C, protein S, antithrombin level deficiency. If they are low, then we will have to wait and uh, once the treatment uh, part is over, then we have to recheck it to make a complete diagnosis of deficiency of these proteins. Factor 5 uh, laden mutation, prothrombin 20210 mutation, all these things should be done for the patients. Now, initial management also includes supportive therapy like uh, airway should be taken care, breathing should be taken care, circulation should be taken care, patient can have hypoxemia, patient can have hypotension because in massive pulmonary embolism there will be a reduced blood su supply to the left ventricle. So, the patient can have uh, hypotension, shock and hypoxemia due to massive pulmonary embolism, oxygen, morphine all can be given, but morphine can sometimes produce uh, hypotension and shock, so we should be very careful. Hypotension again, uh, uh, you have to, in emergency room, we have to treat with IV fluids and noradrenaline. Dubitamine can be added to norepinephrine uh, after uh, the initial BP increases to 100 milligram, 100 mm HC in systolic BP, so it can be added. So, this is a treatment protocol, heparin can be started in all patients who is having uh, pulmonary embolism. You can go for heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Then along with uh, heparin, we can start oral anticoagulants that should be continued. If there is recurrent embolism, inferior vena cavity filter, filters can be tried. There is massive pulmonary embolism or shock, thrombolysis can be advised or if the patient does not respond or if there is a failure for thrombolysis, embolectomy also can be tried. So, this is a flow chart which uh, tell you how to manage pulmonary embolism in emergency room. Heparin dose is 5000 units bolus that is 80 units per kg, then continuous infusion of 1000 units per hour or 18 units per kg per hour monitor APTT. Low molecular weight heparin that is anoxaparin 1.5 milligram per kg daily for 5 days, ondoparinox 5 milligram subcutaneous OD, 7.5 milligram subcutaneous OD can also be tried depending on the weight. Along with heparin we have to start warfarin that is very very important 
don't start warfarin after the completion of the course of heparin warfarin takes some time to act it takes mainly 5 to 7 days to get its peak action so warfarin should be started along with heparin start with heparin first day itself in a average patient 5 mg per day is the dose obese patient 7.5 mg to 10 mg per day is the dose malnourished patient 2.5 mg per day is the dose keep inr around 2.5 so you can either titrate up or down the uh, dose of the warfarin remember when the patient is on warfarin uh, we have to monitor the ptnr keep it around 2.5 it, if it elevates then you have to titrate down or stop the drug temporarily whenever we start any other drug along with warfarin we have to always check the uh, drug interaction with warfarin so the warfarin has got lot of drug interaction with many other drugs and food uh, food materials so we have to be very careful thrombolytic therapy also can be tried in patients who is having very large pulmonary embolism who have hemodynamic instability so normally we give tissue plasminogen activator 100 mg per hour 2 hours or 0.6 mg per kg over 15 minutes so that can be tried other drugs are streptokinase urokinase tenecteplase all these things can be tried so thrombolytic therapy is uh, recommended in massive pulmonary embolism or hemodynamic in- instability tissue plasminogen activator 10 mg iv bolus then 90 mg infused over 2 hours streptokinase urokinase or alternatives if the patient is not uh, willing for thrombolysis or not having indications for thrombolysis or they are contraindicated thrombolysis is contraindicated because allergic reaction or some other uh, bleeding tendency we can go for embolectomy that can be tri- uh, tried if the patient is not a candidate for thrombolysis so we have uh, discussed about one of the important topic in emergency room that is pulmonary embolism they present exactly like pneumonia so we have to have very high index of suspicion to make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism treatment is most of the time it is heparin patient who is having massive pulmonary embolism hemodynamic instability they may require thrombolysis or embolectomy thank you